<laughs> well, hello. How's everybody doing tonight? Good? You guys are in for a treat tonight because you are the very, very first audience that has ever heard John Carl talk about his latest book. And on top of that, the first audience that gets to buy, most importantly, his book. His it's not officially available till tomorrow, okay. but apparently it's going to be here tonight. You guys, it's a sneak peek. It's pretty amazing <laughs> stuff, <Right>. isn't it? <laughs> well, thank you uh, for joining us for this conversation. And I, uh, for, I want to read you a couple of quotes. For John's first book, the first book he ever wrote, he got a blurb from a very famous New Yorker. And the blurb was, Carl is one of the best in the business. Tough, fair, and brutally honest. Now, for his most recent book, Tired of All the Winning, a famous former New Yorker had this to say. Disgraceful and talentless John Carl, <laughs> misspelled by the way, is a backbencher who could never get his own show for obvious reasons. Yes. <laughs> so John, it's fair to say you've had kind of a roller coaster relationship yeah. with the once and possibly future president and you've known him now for 25 some years. And you write in your book that he's even more detached from reality than ever. Help us understand what you mean by that. 25 years later, how, how is he more detached from reality and what does that mean? Well, you know, look, when I first covered him, I was a reporter for the New York Post and Trump was, was not somebody I took particularly seriously. He was kind of like a, a sideshow and if you, uh, I mean, there, there's a story I tell in that first book of um, the, the first time I met him, which is when Michael Jackson and uh, Lisa Marie Presley had just gotten married, or it was revealed that they had gotten married, and they were staying at Trump Tower. And I didn't care much about that story. I was a political guy. I was covering City Hall, but that's all the New York Post carried about. Carried about. <laughs> so I was like, well, why don't we see if we can try to get into Trump Tower? Yeah. I mean, so I, you know, I called up the general number and asked to speak to him and <laughs> got through very, very quickly by saying that I wanted to ask him why the most famous newlyweds on the planet decided to get their honeymoon at Trump Tower. And he wanted to talk about that. So that was the kind of stuff, I mean, it wasn't, so the idea that he, could, he would become president had never at all crossed my mind. But um, look, Davey, I mean, you know, look, we, we, his presidency was, Peter, you and I were there for, for all of it. We, um, I mean, it, it, was, it was like a, a roller coaster ride the entire time. But there were guardrails. Uh, he did have, there were serious people on the White House staff, there were serious people in his cabinet who saw it as their mission to try to protect Donald Trump from his mo most self-destructive impulses and from doing damage to the country. So from doing damage to himself and his White House mm -hmm. and doing damage to, to, to the country. They felt that they you know, needed to kind of like rein him in, just kind of yes him to death, but not really do what, 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 what he was asking. I mean, those people are gone. Mm -hmm. um, the guardrails are gone. In my reporting for this book, which looked really in-depth at the last couple of months of the Trump presidency, that insane transition, mm -hmm but also what he's been doing since he left office. And the, in, the unmistakable conclusion is that he is less restrained than he's ever been. He has become enraptured. Uh, he's become obsessed with conspiracy theories that are of the, of the, of the, of the, of the most detached from reality kind. And I think he has, he's, less respect for the norms and customs of, of, mm. of, our, of our government and of our democracy than ever. We've seen in the last few weeks, people have been writing stories about some of the things he's yeah. saying at the ra rallies, right? He thinks yeah. that he beat Obama in 2016. He thinks Obama is actually still in office now. He seems to be obsessed with Obama. He thinks we're about to head into World War II. Yeah, which would be something, right? right? He confuses towns in Iowa and South Dakota, which, okay, a lot of Sioux people Sioux Falls and Sioux City, I've spent time in, in fairness, both of them. Um, people have done that, but uh, he seemed to think Hungary is bordering Russia. Even when yeah. he's corrected, he repeats the mistake. So is he, is he, you know, I mean, you write about this, about the discussion of the 25th Amendment at the end of his presidency. The 25th Amendment, of course, allows uh, the cabinet and the vice president to remove a president if he's not capable of serving. We have yeah. never really defined what that means. 
the people you have interviewed for this book and for your previous book, do they think he is a, a very stable genius, or are they just, um, I mean, what do they say about him? Well, um, I, I spent a fair amount of time on this question of like mental sanity uh, in, in the book, which I also explored a little bit in, in actually both of the previous other books, because this is not a new question. Right. Uh, if you remember during uh, the, uh, uh, Right after he won in, in 2016, there were a group of psychologists that got together and they, they talked about the duty to warn and they said he is, uh, you know, he is uh, mentally unstable and dangerous and they had never actually examined the guy. They had never been in the same room with the guy. Some, you know, they, they, didn't, they, they just you know, saw his tweets and saw what he was saying on television. And, and you know, it wasn't, I don't think it was necessarily great science uh, to, to, to diagnose somebody from afar. But what I have found is the people that have been closest to Donald Trump um, are the ones who are, first of all, the most piercing in their criticism of him mm -hmm. and their warnings about what it would be like if he were to come back. But also, those are the ones who, who have questioned his mental yeah. uh, you know, stability. I think, I think it's an important point, too, by the way, because of fact, people will ask you questions about your books. Um, my wife and I wrote a book about Trump as well. And what people miss is that the sources for your books, I, I believe, uh, certainly sources for our books, are mostly Republicans. These yeah, are not yeah, liberal yeah. Democrats. The people who are talking to you, right, are people who were up close, who chose to work for him because they wanted to make him yeah. a better president, they wanted to make serve the country or what have you. They were loyal Republicans in many cases. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I described the scene. Uh, I went to his announcement, which was almost exactly a year ago. It was November 15th of, of last year when yeah. he announced he was running for president for the third time down in Mar-a-Lago, and this, the striking thing about it is who was not there. Mm. Most of his family blew it off, and there had been a family wedding, because Tiffany got married the weekend before, and he announced, uh, I believe, the 15th was a Tuesday? I think so, it was, sounds right. And, and, you know, they were all, nobody was there. Don Jr. somehow had some travel plans that he couldn't, you know, or some travel issues. Uh, uh, Ivanka wasn't there, put out a statement right before her father made the announcement, making it clear that she would have nothing to do with uh, his next presidential campaign. Jared showed up, but also making it clear that he was showing up but not taking part. Um, and also, there wasn't a single confirmed cabinet member from the Trump uh, White House uh, that was there. There wasn't a single chief of staff, and Trump had four of them uh, that showed up. There wasn't a single press secretary, he had four of those. None of them came up. Uh, there were people like Sebastian Gorka, who sells relief factor pills in, uh, in case you ever need him on, you know, Fox <laughs> News. Uh, um, it was you know Roger Stone, convicted felon, pardoned by Trump. It was like the D list of Trump list celebrities uh, that were there, and um, the the the. the you know, the, the serious people that were there. I mean, there were serious people, and as you know, in that White House and the administration, they were all gone. Yeah. So, I mean, I want to say this is a very important book, and one of the things I tell people about John's work is that while a lot of people have written books about Trump, John has gotten the point right, which is a lot of times we get distracted by the carnival aspect of it, the cartoonish yeah. aspect of it, because it's so, it's so crazy and out of, the, out of our normal political, political uh, uh, comfort zone. What you've done with your books, and particularly this one and, and, and Betrayal, uh, uh, is talk about the consequences of the country, right? That yeah. this is really important stuff. But you have a lot of new reporting here, and I wanna, I, we can't go through all of it because we'd be here all night. You'll have to buy the book. Um, but a few good ones stood out to me. I'm going to okay, uh, summarize a few of them. You asked Mo Brooks. Mo Brooks is a congressman who was one of the tr Trump's most staunchest supporters. If Trump really believed that he could be reinstated to the White House, after he left the presidency. And Brooks tells you, I sure hope not, because if he truly believed that, then he was way outside the bounds of reality. This guy is not, again, a liberal Democrat, super conservative Freedom Caucus kind of guy. He wore body armor on January 6th right. to the president's rally outside the White House, right. okay? This so even that Brooks. guy thinks the former president was outside the bounds of reality. You, you recount advice that Trump gave to Herschel Walker. Remember, Herschel Walker ran for Senator from Georgia against Raphael Warnock, and the advice that Trump gave him was just call him a child molester. Yeah, just call Warnock a child molester. And, 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 and Walker, to his credit, said, I can't do that. There's no evidence of that. And Trump says, and, Just do it. Just say it. Just say it. Right. 
Right. I mean, <laughs> okay. You write that. Uh, and by the way, uh, that's an interesting scene in the book because he calls Herschel Walker, who puts the call on speaker, and he's with his campaign advisors. And here's Trump telling him how to win because he was going into the, a debate. It was the one and only debate they have. It didn't work, did it? Uh, yeah, he ended up losing that seat. They, they, they've <laughs> yeah. lost Senate seats in Georgia. Was it, is it six times entirely? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, elections, special elections, runoffs. Right. Um, uh, yeah. Since they should win. Yeah. You write that when Kim Kardashian called Trump to get him to pardon a condemned man on death row that she believed Julius to be Jones. innocent. Yep. Right? She believed to be innocent. Trump told her he wouldn't do it. Why wouldn't he do it? Well, uh, it's an amazing call. This is after Trump has left the, the, the White House. He's at Mar-a-Lago. Kim Kardashian, this is a cause of hers. Remember, uh, you know, she, she has pushed for clemency. She's pushed, you know, for, for people wrongly uh, uh, convicted or convicted of drug crimes that have sentences that, that, that were way, you know, outside the bounds of, of what was warranted. Uh, and this was a guy on death row in Oklahoma, and the governor of Oklahoma, she met with him to advocate for the, for the clemency. It was right down to the wire. There were only days left till he was to be executed. Um, and uh, the governor of Oklahoma, and by the way, the pardon, the, the, the pardon board in Oklahoma had already recommended clemency, but the governor has to sign off on it. And the governor said, look, I'll get hammered for this, but if you can get Trump, you know Trump, you dealt with Trump, if you can get Trump to endorse clemency, I'll do it. So she calls Trump, and he says, you voted for Biden, and now you want me to do a favor for you? And hung up on her. And that was the last conversation they ever had. Now, for, you know, fortunately for Julius Jones, on death row, Stitt at the very last 11th hour decided to do the pardon anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And even though it wasn't his, his political interest, that wasn't... Right. Right. His criteria. Right. 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 Well, I like these anecdotes because. And by the way, Kim Kardashian, I don't, I don't know, I didn't get into a lot of details of this in the book, but um, she became like worried, like, how did he find out who I voted for? Because, because, <laughs> because she hadn't said who she voted for. I, I think it was an educated guess, though. I don't yeah. think he actually had access to she the She didn't voter deny rolls. it, did she? No, 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 no. <laughs> and by the way, this is the same reason that Trump is mad at Bibi Netanyahu, by the yes, way. This yes, yes. how yeah. great domestic policy and foreign policy is made. You, your death row decisions are made on, based on whether you're yes. interlocutor or voted for him or not. Yep. Um, well, that makes me think about the election. She voted maybe for Biden, maybe she didn't. But um, he believes she did. And yet he doesn't believe enough people voted for Biden to actually right, 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 beat right. him. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about this because it, it's a question that all of us get. Does he believe that he truly won that election? Or does he convince himself of this and live in this reality world that he creates for himself? Or is he just the most persistent liar that we've ever had? So, so I think this, this is an important question. And let me get to it first by saying that he cannot acknowledge he lost because he believes that his entire career, not just his political career, but his career in business has been built on being the greatest winner. I am the guy, the biggest, the greatest, the most successful. I am the master of business, now the master of politics. The biggest crowds, biggest everything. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he said in an interview uh, in, uh, in 2014, the year before he announced he was running for president, uh, to a biographer, uh, didn't come out till later. He said, I, if, you, if you lose, nobody will follow you because they will think you're a loser. I mean, this isn't exactly like Nietzsche, okay? But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but this is his like world philosophy. This is, if, if, if you lose, people won't follow you because they'll think you're a loser. And he's, I you know, think firmly believes that applies to him. And if he lost to Biden, for God's sake, this is the guy that didn't come out of his basement. All the stuff he says about Biden, if he, could, if he admitted that he lost, I think he thinks that all those people with the red hats would run away. Right. Um, so so it's, it's cynical. So it, it's cynical. And I, I, I don't know whether or not you know, Jack Smith has, has, has been making a case that, that Trump uh, knew. I don't know that that's true. I don't know that it matters. I'm not a lawyer, so we can let people figure that out. He certainly had reasons to know it wasn't true because all of the people of any substance around him told him that it was BS. That he it told him that he had lost and the fraud was done from bar on down. Um, uh, you know, he, would, he only wanted to listen to the people that had the wacky conspiracy theories. 
Um, but I'll tell you this, I do believe, and you alluded to this uh, earlier, I do believe that the evidence shows uh, in the reporting in this book that he believed for a full year plus after he left the office in one of the most outlandish theories that, that, that I have ever heard that, that he could be reinstated as president. You alluded it to, to the Mo Brooks thing. He, he was obsessed with this. He was watching closed circuit television of the cyber ninjas recount in Arizona, okay? I mean, nobody else was looking at this. And he, <laughs> he got to know like all the, um, and, and, and he, he believed that this was gonna show massive fraud in Arizona and then you know, the next thing you knew, Georgia would do something, and next thing you know, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, and the Supreme Court was, he, he, he believed that, that they were gonna, they, I don't know who the they is, uh, were, were gonna evict Biden from the White House and reinstall him as president. And that's what the Mo Brooks thing was mm -hmm. about. He wanted Mo Brooks to come out and say it publicly. Um, you know, so, did, does he believe he lost? I mean, I, I I think at this point, it does almost irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. But I do believe that he believed that he could either, either because he doesn't believe he lost or because he could fool people, that he could have gotten back in before the next election. Well, the other people uh, forget is his track record on, uh, to your point about he cannot accept being a loser. Every single time he has lost anything, he has claimed that something was rigged, right? Yep. That it was corrupt, that it was uh, you know, stolen or whatever. Even things he didn't, you know, even things like the Emmy for yep. his show, whatever that was called, The, the Apprentice. It was, uh, I've forgotten the other one that won it. He, he stalks out of the theater that night saying the yep. whole thing was rigged and the Iowa caucus was rigged yep. and, and yep. the Hillary Clinton uh, winning the popular vote yeah, was that, rigged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember he set up a commission to, to get find out what really happened with the popular. That right. commissioner, the commissioner didn't really do it. It disbanded after a year because they didn't find yeah. anything, of course, yeah. right? And then yeah. he told us in May of 2020, what he was going to do. This is something I think we don't pay enough attention to. He told us in May of 2020 that if he didn't win, it means that the election was rigged. In other words, only yes. the only thing he would ever accept was a victory. Everything else was illegitimate in his yeah. mind. No, sometimes he's incredibly transparent. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's an example. He also said on uh, uh, election day in 2022 that if Republicans win big, I deserve the credit. And if they lose, I don't deserve any of the blame. Yes. I mean, he's kind of said it. Um, but, you know, I got to say, I mean, one thing, and, and Peter, you and I have both had the incredible privilege of covering multiple presidents and multiple presidential campaigns. And I don't know how you feel about this, but I feel that some of the most compelling speeches that I have heard from political figures in our country have been concession speeches. Absolutely. People who lost. And you know, I think back to John McCain's concession uh, in 2008 uh, to, to Barack Obama, and the people start booing his name. He's like, "No, you know, we're yeah. we're going to wish him luck. He's, He's now going to be our." Now. And and another one, I I covered that 2000 campaign mm -hmm. day in and day out, much of it covering Al Gore, and the speech he gave after the Supreme Court shut down the recount in in Florida at a very tense time in this country and uh, real seething anger from Democrats, from mm -hmm. his supporters. And he gave, I think, one of the best speeches of his life. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, conceding the race yeah. and wishing the best to George W. Bush. I think there is something so central to American democracy in those moments. I agree. And I, those are my two favorite as well. And I think the, the 2000 one's important because people compare 2020 to 2000, they're nothing alike. Nothing no. like. 2000 was about one state with five, a difference of 135 votes at one yep. point. So yeah, there was a question there as to who won that. It was a yep. legitimate thing to play out. And they played it out in the system and, and Al Gore in accepted, the legal system. He, the legal he accepted system. the yeah. verdict of the system. Yeah. And he had every reason to say otherwise. And by the way, he was a sitting vice president and a vice president really can change an election on the counting on J January 6th. He was playing Mike Pence on January 6th of... Yeah. Uh, of, right. of 2001. Imagine what the Republicans would have said if Al Gore said, I've decided I don't count the Florida votes and I yeah. win. Yeah, we're sending them back to Florida. Yeah, <laughs> sending yeah. them back to Florida, I win, let's go ahead yeah. and have the inauguration. I mean, it would have been yep. crazy. Um, you say, uh, I think your point about the people who were around him in his first term is an important one, which there are a lot of people who believe in the system and work for him even 
given their own reservations and in some way or another restrain him from doing things that they consider to be unwise, illegal, unconstitutional, yeah. or what have you, dangerous, reckless. They will not be there mm -hmm. if there's a second term. It will be a whole crew of people who, who are enablers, who want to, who share his philosophy or otherwise want to help him do the things he wanted to do. You write a lot in your book here as well as in Betrayal about a guy named Johnny McEntee. Well, I think in some, in some ways you have made correctly into a case study of, of this. Tell us yep. a little bit about Johnny McEntee. So Johnny McEntee is actually one of the very first people that I met on the Trump campaign back in 2015. When Trump had uh, you know, first launched that campaign, there was no real campaign apparatus. He had a, an office in Trump Tower um, on the fifth floor um, right below where the apprentice uh, set was, right upstairs that had been kind of like walled off, uh, but still there, I guess, in case he needed to redo Celebrity uh, Apprentice. He, hadn't, he had nobody. He had, he had a Corey Lewandowski was running, uh, was the campaign manager. Hope Hicks handled everything in terms of communication. And there was Dan Scavino who handled his uh, tweets and his Instagram account. And there was, you know, a couple people to handle logistics. And that's it. And there was Johnny McEntee, <laughs> who I... I went into that office the first time I just walked into it. It was empty, except there was Johnny McEntee. He was in his 20s. Uh, he had just been working at Fox News on, on the desk as a very junior, junior position. And he quit to come and volunteer to work for Donald Trump. And very earnest, likable. He's the guy that gave me the tour of the Trump campaign headquarters, including the apprentice set upstairs. Mm -hmm. I thought, a really nice guy. I, I, I still have the card he gave me because yeah. he had a card printed up already. He was really See that proud of football video? That's yeah, yeah, yeah. He, really he was, good. He was a UConn quarterback, and he, and he did this viral video doing all these trick football uh, passes. It's impressive. You know, uh, I think Trump really liked him because he's a like good looking. He was a quarter, as I, as I wrote, he was a, he was a quarterback, and he looked like a quarterback, you yeah. know? So, like, mm -hmm. Trump liked having him around. Um, so he became what we call the body guy, which is just he carried the president's bags wherever, he, or the candidate in that case, bags, and he, and he kept that job into the White House. He had a desk right outside the Oval Office, um, literally, like the, it's not, a, it's not a separate office, it's a place they call the Outer Oval, and there are some desks set up, there's a president's secretary and whatnot, but he had the one right outside the door. So at the, you know, beck and call, he'd be there to do whatever Trump wanted. Uh, he ended up getting fired by John Kelly because he had some gambling issues and some stuff came up in his background, FBI background check, so he got fired. After Kelly was gone, not that long after that, towards the end of the Mulvaney era, he got brought back in. And this is right at the beginning of, of uh, 2020, right, 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 as the, right before the pandemic really mm -hmm. hits. Um, and they make him the head of presidential personnel, which is basically the most important HR department in the country, okay? I mean, this is the hiring and firing of every political appointee, 4,000 of them in the executive uh, branch, from cabinet secretaries to NIH to, I mean, uh, you know, all, all, I mean, really, really important job. And I was like, has Johnny ever hired anybody before? Is he ever like, uh, <laughs> nope, not a soul. Um, but he was in that job, he was 29 turning 30, and, he was put in that job because his entire mission was to root out anybody in the administration that was not sufficiently loyal to Donald Trump. And he started doing these loyalty interviews. Uh, having, he hired all his friends to come in. Um, you know, all these young kids, a couple of them had not graduated from college yet. And they went out kind of badgering cabinet secretaries, deputy secretaries, and on down. Anyway, so John McEntee is now helping a project called Project 2025, which is to set the agenda, both in terms of personnel and policy, for a next Trump administration, or for next Republican administration, but these are all the Trump people, um, out of the Heritage Foundation. And he went about weeding out people that were insufficiently loyal at, just at the end of the last Trump administration. But he's gonna be there, and if not Johnny, it'll be somebody just like Johnny to do what Johnny's doing. Still a very friendly guy, by the way. I mean, I call him up. I, I, every time I'm writing about him, I call him and let him know what's going on. I don't think he minds it. <laughs> yeah, I'm the guy that's out there. I'm going to take yeah. out. I don't want any of these rhinos or yeah. these. And, and so from the very beginning, you will have, you will have and, and, and there was a story in Axios, mm -hmm. uh, uh, just as it today, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, talking about how they're even using some AI to try to go through potential candidates uh, for, for positions in a future Trump administration to go through all of their social media accounts and everything 
to try to detect any kind of thought that would suggest insufficient loyalty to Donald mm -hmm. Trump. So that's the starting point right. of another Trump White House. And the thing is, of course, like, look, every president wants their people to be loyal to them. There's something, you know, universal Team of rivals that. under but Abraham Lincoln, team of sycophants. Team of sycophants. Well, that's the problem, right, is, is that he has understood that the grandees of the party who suggested this person or that person, this, these people with great resumes or whatever, were not loyal to him. And has he determined it? By the way, in some cases, he was absolutely right. He was, yeah. Um, I mean, but they would be what they would say is they were loyal in some cases, like Mark Milley to the Constitution or what have you. Exactly. Yeah, that's John Kelly told me, which is a few weeks into his term as uh, as as chief of staff, if I could write a book about my tenure, it would right. be tweets not sent, decisions not made, or right. decisions not made, tweets not sent. Right. I mean, they they would try to. Like as long as they would like say okay okay and then they would go and like quietly throw out whatever he was right. doing. Right. And his conception, I'll tell it, if you don't mind a story that we wrote about about with John Kelly once. He says to Kelly, "How are you?" He got mad at the generals. Right. Kelly had been a four star, Jim Mattis, HR of Master. He said, "You you effing generals! How come you're not loyal like the German generals?" Yeah. And Kelly says, "Well, what do you mean the German generals? What are you talking about?" He says, "Yeah, World War II, the German generals. You mean Hitler's generals? Yes, Hitler generals. They were very loyal to him. And yeah, Kelly they says, were. Well, yeah. you know, they tried to kill him three times, yeah, but otherwise, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? That was his conception of loyalty, right? Yeah. But isn't even just that? I mean, McEntee even okay, he's a personnel guy, but he went beyond that, right? In the final days of the administration, he was setting war and peace policy. I'm telling you, this is some of the. I mean, this is really kind of mind-blowing stuff. Uh, you, it's hard to be surprised anymore about what happened uh, during the Trump presidency, but especially those last couple of months. But this is really, really something else. Uh, so um, when John McEntee orchestrated the firing of Mark Esper right after the election, Mark Esper was the defense secretary. He, he, he's got a rap sheet uh, that, 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 that McEntee staff put together that uh, Esper now uses as his bio because it says <laughs> his sins were he tried to keep the department apolitical, Department of Defense apolitical. I mean, that's a terrible thing. <laughs> Can't do that. Um, uh, uh, directed the department uh, to, to, to deal with, you know, towards against Russia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, supported diversity and inclusion. I mean, it was like, it was a lot of, so he now has this as his, uh, <laughs> uh, opposed the use of, act, of the uh, Insurrection Act to put active duty U.S. Uh, U.S. military on the streets of American cities to put down riots. These were his sins. So he was fired. They put in a guy named Chris um, uh, Miller as the as the acting defense secretary. Um, and McEntee knew that what Trump wanted is he wanted out of Afghanistan. He, you know, the, and, the, and the generals had always kind of blocked him. He, he wanted American troops out of Germany, out of Europe. He wanted, you know, and these guys never wanted to implement what he wanted to do, which is actually true. They actually were like reining them in. Mm -hmm. So um, McEntee, with the help of this uh, Fox News analyst, retired colonel uh, named Kurtz. No, McGregor. McGregor. Uh, Kurtz is the guy from Apocalypse Now, right? Um, <laughs> um, uh, he's, uh, yeah. Um, easy to get mixed up. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, anyway. Um, uh, so uh, he wants to draft a, a presidential directive to order the immediate withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan, from Germany, uh, from, uh, from Syria, and then eventually they also added um, uh, uh, from, um, from, from Africa. Somalia, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I have the whole scene. This is all based on sworn testimony that, that, that was gathered by the January 6th committee but never mentioned in their reports or any of their hearings. They interviewed everybody that was a part of this. And it's just amazing. McEntee wrote this thing by getting on Google to find out how you do a presidential order. McGregor, the colonel, asked him to go to a file cabinet to get an old executive order so he could see how it's formatted on the page. And he put this thing, sent it over to the Pentagon for the new acting defense secretary, who then sees it and is like, oh, wow, we guess we had some work to do, calls in the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, who looks at it. Remember, Milley's job is to provide military advice to the president. He's like, who did this? Who provided military advice on this? And like, Miller, the acting defense, I don't know. I don't know who did this. So they run over to the White House, and the national security advisor knows nothing about it. The, the, the staff secretary, who is the one that has to implement and, and post all presidential orders, knows nothing about it. The White House counsel knows nothing about it. 
Um, the, 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 the national security advisor to the vice president knows nothing about it. And then finally, like two of them go down to talk to Trump and say, did you sign this? <laughs> and he kind of sheepishly says, uh, yeah. <laughs> It's like, and, and they kind of talk to me. It's like, well, you know, it hasn't gone through any process. I think we should probably not do this. <laughs> ended up not doing it. But that's how um, close it came. But that's, and, and it was, and it was, and, and by the way, there's a sim. I won't go into as much detail, but there's a similar thing about, about Pence. I mean, the whole effort to try to get Pence to overturn the election begins with a memo written by Johnny McEntee and his buddy who just graduated law school, who, you know, Trump had heard this idea and they Googled it again and, and then wrote up this thing about how Thomas Jefferson used his power as vice president to win the 18, it, actually he didn't, it's not true. I mean, it's a total misreading of, but McAtee was, again, they're willing to do anything. Right, and it's, it's remarkable, and it's a remarkable story. So you make the point, and we're gonna have, by the way, if you haven't, I think we're gonna have questions soon. If you've gotten cards, I hope you're writing them out. Uh, make them as tough as possible. Yeah, uh, ask Peter for him, questions for, for him. <laughs> you make the point that a new version of Profiles and Courage would uh, include a, a handful of Republicans who broke mm -hmm. with Trump over the years and sacrificed their political careers as a result. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about that. I mean, why, ha I mean, that may be the answer, right? Why so few Republicans have broken with him? You, 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 I come back to something that Kevin McCarthy told you three days after January 6th, right? He told you, um, what's really crazy is back in our district, there are tons of people who are ready to storm the Capitol again. So is that it? Are they just afraid of their own voters? Kevin what, McCarthy the... told me that, I think it was on January 9th or yeah. January, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what is it about, because the, these probably you and I know, we talk to them off the record. The vast majority of elected Republicans in Washington and professional Republicans in Washington are not Trumpers. No. And maybe they share some of his political philosophy, maybe they don't, but they definitely, you know, 70, 80% of them just as soon he go away. So why is it that they are so willing to go along? Well, um, first of all, just quickly, there are, I think it, it's important to point out that there are Republicans, some of them very conservative Republicans who were very strong supporters of him, of Trump, who did the right thing when the time came. And I think in some ways, saved American democracy, and I don't think I'm being overly dramatic in saying that. Um, and I think some of those were on his staff. I think that, you know, I think Bill Barr played a really, played a very critical role um, on December 1st yep. when he came out and flatly said, and he did it because mm -hmm. he saw what Trump was trying to do. Yep. Came out and flatly said there was no fraud that would change the results of the election. And by the way, there's a scene there where McConnell, <laughs> Whatever you think of McConnell, McConnell did stand up and say that there was no fraud, we have to move on. And, and McConnell was the one that urged Barr to come out yeah. and, 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 and do this. Uh, but there are people within the administration and there are people in Congress, Liz Cheney, obviously, mm -hmm. um, who I think was a, on a track to be Speaker of the House. Um, and she's now exiled from, she lost her right. seat in Wyoming. She got thrown out of leadership. Um, right, she will be on this stage in a couple weeks, so make sure you get tickets. And, 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 and she did not waver. Yeah. One minute uh, uh, on this. Um, Mitt Romney, um, who decided not to run uh, again, I don't know if he would have been beaten in a primary in, in, in Utah or not, uh, but Romney voted not once but twice to convict Donald Trump in an impeachment trial. All right, we got some questions. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Uh, but why, why, why do so many others fall in and, not, and, 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 and just don't stand up? I, there are two moments that I think are critical and, and the big what if moments of the last two and a half, three years. The first was on January 28th of 2021, eight days after Trump left office. He's a, he's a disgraced, defeated president that is persona non grata. And Kevin McCarthy makes a decision to go and see him at Mar-a-Lago. That's number, item number one. The second, which may be more important, happens eight days earlier, on January 20th, the last day of the Trump presidency, when, as I reported in Betrayal, Ronna McDaniel, 
the chair of the Republican Party, calls Trump to say, you know, thank you for everything, good luck, it's been a great blah, 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 just a, just a pro forma call that, as he's preparing to take off on Air Force One for his last flight home. And he is furious at the fact that he's had to leave and Biden's about to be inaugurated and he tells her, I'm leaving the Republican Party. You people didn't do enough to fight me. If you did, I would still be president. And, um, you know, I'm going to start my own party. And what McDaniel did, this is the important thing, is she begged him not to leave the party um, and said, if you do that, we will all lose and you'll be hurting all the people who did so much for you, as if like that kind of an appeal to Trump. Mm -hmm. So that didn't work, obviously. <laughs> and then over the course of the next five days, she and, and her team at the RNC try a different tactic, which is to threaten him and say, if you leave the party, first of all, you know we're still paying your legal bills. We stop immediately. If you leave the party, we're going we're gonna to eliminate your ability to raise the money you've been raising because we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna make the mailing list that you use public for free. Um, and so he, he starts seeing that it's going to cost him millions of dollars to leave the party. And he doesn't. So the two what ifs. What if McCarthy says, you know what, we're going in a different direction. Mm -hmm. What if Ronna McDaniel says, good riddance. Yeah, so be it. Now, the reason why they didn't is because they both made the same calculation. Yeah. If he left the party, he was going to take millions of voters with him, and Republicans wouldn't lose, you know, would, would, would lose elections for a generation. Yeah. And they may be right. And they may be right. They may be right. So we're but you know what? They did a pretty good job losing elections after that. After that, that's what they right. Did. Exactly. And maybe there's an argument that you need to rebuild from the ground up. Yep. We're going to be, uh, don't forget, when we're done here, the books are uh, for sale outside. Jonathan's going to stay to sign. You want to go want a signed book? Um, before I get to these questions, yep. I just want to wrap up on, the, on doing this book. You interviewed Trump twice for the last one, for Betrayal. Yep. I take it he didn't give you an interview for this one. He didn't seem too eager to talk to me okay. this time. Okay. Yeah. Why did he give you an interview for the last one, and what do you think you know, changed this time? Because he knew the last one wasn't going to be some suck up -y book. Um, you know, he... I'll tell you, for a guy that literally declared people like you and I to be traitors to our country, yeah. enemies of the people, he really spent a lot of time cultivating the press. Yeah. Um, and um, he would vilify me, vilify you, a little less, a little nicer to you. Um, <laughs> Um, but you know, and and I remember there was you're one a bigger target. You know, there was there, there was one there was one particular press conference during COVID where he called me um, a third-rate reporter and uh, a disgrace to I forget. It was a lot of things, um, and and it was like really. I mean, you know, you're in a nationally televised press conference. There's only 14 reporters in the room because of COVID. I mean, it's like pretty intense. You got the, yeah. you know, and. Um, uh, I remember that press conference because about 10 minutes later, he's taking, I, I raise my hand again, and he calls on me again like nothing happened. <laughs> now you're second rate. Yeah. You've been promoted. So, so I, I don't know. So I, so I think that's why he gave me the interviews in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I, I do think that he's changed. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I, I think that, I think that, the, your book as well. I think there, there, I think there were there were some reporting after he left the White House that really exposed truths that he was uncomfortable mm. having exposed. Yeah. My second interview with him, which is right before I went uh, to press, it was just over the phone, was a much surlier and nastier Donald Trump, mm. and he was uh, and 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 it ended with him hanging up on me. So I wasn't surprised. So you and Kim Kardashian. Yeah, 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 that's right. You guys that's right. have that's something right. in yeah. common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to get to the audience questions. And actually, the, this is a good question because it kind of uh, uh, mirrors something I was interested in. What, here's a question. Why would CNN have another town hall with Trump, or is that just a rumor? Isn't that dangerous? I want to twist that a little bit. I want to rephrase that question a little bit, not to criticize other journalists, because I feel like there's more than there's, there's plenty of people doing there's that. more than people out there do that. So I don't, personally, I never get into media criticism. But I do think it's a good question to say, 
what is, as, as a skilled and, 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 and first rate, not third rate interviewer, <laughs> how do we approach Trump as a candidate? When and how can we interview him in a way that is journalistically sound without falling into a trap? Do you have a thought on that? Uh, I, I, I have a lot of thoughts on that. I don't have an easy answer to it. Yeah. And I think, you, I think that it can extend to a debate, whether he ever does a debate again. Yeah. Because it'd be the same thing. Uh, do, do you put Donald Trump unfiltered on stage, even with another candidate, um, and just knowing that he's going to be saying things that are simply not true, and he's going to be using that platform? Remember, he doesn't have the same platform he used to have. As president, he could call the White House pool in, you know, the, the, the network to pull, and talk to the world, you know, in five minutes' notice. Uh, he could tweet. And he is, he is back on Twitter, but he's not using it. Uh, he, you know, he, 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 could, he could drive stories with a tweet. Now he puts out something on Truth Social, and I mean, we may not even notice it unless yeah. somebody tells, hey, by the way, did you see? Yeah. Um, uh, so he doesn't have the same platform anymore. So you are giving him a massive platform if you do that. Um, I think you can interview Trump, um, even in this time. I think there are examples of how it's been done Effectively, Brett Baer at Fox News did a, I thought, a very strong interview mm -hmm. because he was prepared to fact check him in real time, right. which is a lot harder than it looks. It's really hard. I mean, there are, you can, it's, it's really hard, and he's good at filibustering, yeah. and he's, um, but this is, this is not an easy question, and I, I, don't, I don't, you know, a live interview with Trump is, is fraught. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I went out and did an interview with Kerry Lake, who's kind of like uh, a junior Trump, um, and in some ways much more effective. Um, and I interviewed her shortly before the elections in 2022 um, when she lost. Yes, she lost in Arizona. Um, and first of all, I didn't air it live. Hmm. And I was there every question, I was prepared with what the facts were. And she actually got, it was rare, she actually got flustered. Mm. And, um, but I think, you know, I, I, I real qualms about doing that interview as well. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that she is kind of rapid fire misinformation right. and attack the interviewer and win points by doing that. Right. Um, but I made a calculation to, to do it, um, but it, it's tough. I, I feel like we can't have a person run and win the presidency without having taking tough questions, but I'm not quite sure how they're... I know, but how do you... Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's a challenge. It really yeah. is. I, I, I think you, your points are right. Like, live is probably not the best option. It has to be a chance to edit, a chance to insert, and make sure fact-checking. But you're right, to fact-check him, he just, uh, he's like a bulldozer. No, it's like, I mean, it's He'll like... run it's, right it's, past it's, Yeah, 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 yeah. To be able to yeah. do that. All right. Uh, I mean, the Brett Bear interview is worth going back to look at because it was, it was one of the few where he... He didn't fact check everything the guy said, obviously, no, but it was. But he did was, a good job. And and look, I, and the interviews, the interviews that I've had with Trump that have been most revealing, and and this is where television has got a, a disadvantage. Uh, I, the book interviews, um, because I'm not there to like. It doesn't matter. He can lie all he wants because yeah. I'm not. I'm, I'm going to use what I need to use, right. and and I'm able to kind of draw out from him his true views. In my first interview with him for Betrayal, uh, I asked him about Mike Pence and if he was concerned about him when they were, you know, the murderous chance of hanging Mike Pence. He said, no, no, no. He was like, yeah, but that was awful. And he said, well, they were angry. Um, you certainly understand. I mean, you know, how can you pass on a fraudulent vote? I was like, they were saying hang. So that was like a real revealing moment. It wasn't yeah. a gotcha, like I didn't get in his face. How about this? How about that? I right. just let him talk. Right, but that's but your point. And that is was exactly a much right. more valuable. It's a different. There's a different requirement for a TV interview than for a book or a yeah. print interview. Yep. Or, you know, and when we we did our interviews for our book, and we just I mean he was not a reliable fact witness, right? You're not going there to interview him because he's going to tell you what happened on June the second of blah blah blah, and then I did this and then I did that because yeah. you couldn't rely no. on it. No. You're looking for revelatory uh, comments like that. Did he, he interview right in the lobby at? Um, yeah. The first so one. And, and what time of day was your interview? Five o'clock. Five o'clock. So this is, we, we had the exact same experience. So it's like, so, so you go into Mar-a-Lago, <laughs> and which is, there are lots of private rooms you could go and do, and, and the interview is conducted right in the middle of the lobby, right as happy hour is beginning. Yeah. 
And all of his paying members are coming in. Oh, just, just so everybody can see him right. being interviewed. Look who I got. I got John Carl. Look, from I got ABC the great News. Peter Bangle, the yeah. New York Times yeah. is here with me, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, this, this is part of the show. Yep, yep. It was all part of the show. Yep. Uh, all right, more questions from the audience. What will Trump do if he loses again? What will he do if he wins again? I think we've talked about what he'll do if he wins again. What will he do if he loses again? He'll graciously concede. <laughs> <wish, yeah. laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> this is a real. Look, first of all, it's different. He's no longer president. So um, if he loses again and doesn't admit it, you know, he's a guy at Bedminster or in Mar-a-Lago and in, to some degree who cares about it. But the question is, does his failure to concede and his cries of fraud and stolen election inspire his supporters to act in a violent way? That's... The, the truly scary thing. Look what's happened the last few days with these envelopes with powder yeah. sent to election Fent officials. Fentanyl to election officials. Um, look, this is real. Uh, he, he doesn't care about the effect that his words have upon his own people. And, and this is... Yeah. This is really troubling. I and mean, when he goes to Waco to do his first campaign rally, which is, um, you know, obviously the site of the Branch Davidian uh, showdown that became the inspiration for Timothy McVeigh, who bombed the Oklahoma City Federal Building a year later. Um, it's it's deeply two years later, deeply, deeply, deeply troubling. Um, I asked Steve Bannon a question as, you know, there were some of these incidents, not, not the latest with the letters, but we, 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 there, was a, there was an FBI field office in Ohio mm -hmm. where a gunman went in uh, right after the Mar-a-Lago uh, search warrant was executed by the, um, by the FBI. And I asked Bannon, aren't you worried that there will be violence? And his answer to me was no, because we're going to win. So that kind of, and, and he referenced the Branch Davidians, right? Yeah, he, and he, uh, yeah, he, he, you know, I asked him why he got really Waco. I mean, basically, almost exactly on the thirtieth anniversary of the uh, of the siege of the Branch Davidians. He's like, yeah, we're the Trump Davidians. Right. All right. This is a two, a double barrel question. You get to pick and choose, I guess. How do you think the Green Party and RFK Jr. and Jill Stein and No Label, what will that do in the election? And will Trump end up in jail? <laughs> yeah. Two good questions. Uh, <laughs> maybe not directly. Right? Yeah, yeah. So um, you could take either. Let's both. take the jail first. I have a hard time imagining him actually behind bars. And by the way, how does that work? Because a former president does have Secret Service protection. So does the Secret Service off agent have to be in the cell or outside the cell? Um, it's just hard for me to imagine how that happens. All these questions are so mind-boggling. I'll add a third, which is if he's elected president. He'll try to call off the, the, the Justice Department cases or pardon himself or something like that. But Georgia, that prosecution can still go forward. So what happens if a state convicts and sentences to prison a president? Mm -hmm. I mean, how does that, can that, I mean, is that, what, uh, um, so it's hard for me, uh, but will he be convicted? Uh, I, I think that there's a high likelihood that he's, I mean, look, we have four criminal cases. Yeah. Um, the classified documents case is the most seems open and shut, except it's in Florida with a judge that seems very sympathetic to the concerns of his legal team. It will ultimately be a jury made up of Florida. I, I mean, I just, you know, that's, it's a very good jury pull for him. It's not hard to imagine that yeah. there's a juror that decides not to, so who knows? Uh, the January 6th case is moving along much more quickly because it's a different judge. Uh, and it, it's got a, also will have a jury pool of Washington, D.C., which, um, so you have that, uh, uh, the Fulton County case. I mean, I, I, I... Do you think, we all said before the indictments, not all, but a lot of us said before the indictments, well, if he's indicted, that may change things in terms of politics. Can, yeah. And it didn't. In fact, it went the other direction. His, his popularity within the party, not within the general election audience. And I think we make that distinction. Yes, very important But it went up among yes. Republican primary voters. 
would a conviction change something? There's, there's some evidence that a conviction, a conviction would change things. Um, and there's certainly Republican operatives who will tell you that they think that a conviction could change things. Mm -hmm. But as you said, there's no guarantee in, in any of this. What was the other question? Uh, RFK and the independence. Oh, that's a good one. So, I mean, Democrats are petrified by this. Yeah. Uh, now, RFK is a little bit of a different case because it, there's some evidence that his support is actually coming more from, uh, from, from Trump voters. You know, he's hardcore anti-vaccine. He's hardcore conspiracy theorists at this point. Um, you know, one of the people that was really boosting him before he announced he was going to go independent was Bobby Kennedy. Was was uh, was Bannon who was saying Bobby Kennedy Jr. should be the um, you know the running mate for Trump. Um, but look, Jill Stein uh, running. We saw what she did to Hillary Clinton. I mean, may have had a decisive impact, mm -hmm. but certainly, arguably, did. Um, we saw what Ralph Nader did uh, to, uh, to Al Gore. 92,000 um, votes in Florida. We have the whole uh, uh, no labels movement and you know, Manchin's clearly thinking about that. I don't see Manchin like igniting a massive populist revolt in this country against both parties, but he could potentially take away votes. Uh, and in, in a close race, it could be decisive. Yeah. Um, and Cornell West is probably the one that worries them the most, actually. Because he's the most definably liberal yeah. with a yeah. strong base in the progressives. And right now, the progressives are mad at Biden, particularly yeah. over the Hamas-Israel uh, thing, right? Some of them. But th this, uh, this is a subject for another conversation. But in a moment in time where you have the vast majority of, of, of voters in poll after poll saying that they are unhappy with both parties' presumptive nominees, I mean, it does feel like we are in a moment where you know, the, the, the two-party system, let's say, is strained, yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. But our system of government makes it almost impossible. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember, but Abraham Lincoln joined a third party a while back, um, and it worked out. I mean, it's, it can yeah. happen. It can happen. Um, but it's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> and, 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 and the thing is, if, if obviously, if neither, if neither candidate, if no candidate gets a majority of the electoral votes, which is what you would have in a situation where you had a multi-party competitive race, uh, it's decided by the House of Representatives, which means Republicans pick. Oh or Democrats pick, because it, it's the new House, right? It's, it's the new House, but it's, 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 it's one vote one per, per congressional state. delegation. Right. So the Wyoming delegation gets the same number of votes as the California delegation. Right, right. and that's built in structurally. Yeah, it, there's a structural advantage for Republicans. Yeah. Then. That's right. Yeah. We're almost wrapping up here. Um, I'm gonna, we'll finish with this question. How is it possible, uh, one of our audience members writes, that so many people in the country don't care or know about overwhelming evidence of Trump's instability and so forth? I mean, we, we, you've written a lot. We've all written a lot. We've, does it, are, do they just think that we're making it up? Does it not bother them? Do they, do they think that it's overstated? What, what is your, what's your sense of that? Like, why? I, I, I think that Donald Trump's war on truth um, and the way he popularized that phrase fake news, which was really used first by Hillary Clinton to describe actual fake news, um, uh, has, had a, has helped convince a good chunk of the country, not a majority, not even, not all Republicans, but, but a good chunk of the country to disbelieve anything you say or anything that I say. Yeah. I think that's I think that is, is, is a real factor in all of this. But I also think the reason why I wrote this book, and I tried to write this book for Republicans. I mean, I tried, to, I tried to write this in a very factual way. This is what is going on. This is what he has been up to. Um, this, I, I didn't try to write this as a polemic, as like a, you know, a partisan screed. I, I, I tried to write this as journalism. I think one of the things that has happened, well, two. People's memories have faded as to what it was really like, mm -hmm. particularly at the end of the Trump administration. Memories fade quickly. And that people have no idea what he's actually been up to. Yeah. People have seen the coverage of the court cases and all this, but they don't know what he has actually been up to since he left office. So I wrote this book to address both of those concerns. All right, well thank you very much, John. Thank you guys for coming. John's gonna be outside <laughs> signing books. Buy some for your you. cousins, your friends, your loved ones, as many as possible. Great job. Thank you.